Our scripture today is a story. How many of you love stories? I know I do. I teach a lot of them. Um, our story today is a story that Jesus told. It's found in Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. It's a story about wheat and weeds. It goes like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who planted good seed in his field. That night, when everyone was asleep, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then left. Later, the weeds sprouted and the heads of grain grew. The wheat sprouted, but the weeds also grew. Then the man's servants came to him and said, You planted good seed in your field. Where did the weeds come from? The man answered, An enemy planted weeds. The servants asked, do you want us to pull up the weeds? The man answered, no, because when you pull up the weeds, you might also pull up the wheat. Let the weeds and the wheat grow together until the harvest time. At harvest time, I will tell the workers, first gather the weeds and tie them together to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. going there it is all right cool um, this sermon is is part three of a series and I apologize if uh, you guys missed the the two first uh, parts but we've been talking about uh, the kingdom of heaven and this p wonderful parable that Jesus told about the seed in his field and uh, by just a just a way to wrap it up right quick um, Jesus, of course, is the good shepherd. He is also the light of the world. He's also the bread of life. He's also the good farmer. He's the one that plants seed. And we all know that text where Jesus says, wherever my word goes, it will not return to me void. When Jesus plants his word in our hearts, it grows and it brings forth fruit in our lives. And that's God's plan. That's his beautiful plan. Um, so before we uh, uh, start into this third part, I would like us to pray and just ask the Lord to be with us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful word. Thank you that you have loved us so much that you were willing to plant uh, this good seed in our life. And we know that Jesus came uh, to uh, show us a living example of the gospel and what it means to live a life completely dedicated, committed to the Father. Uh, Lord Jesus, may your Holy Spirit be here and bless us and walk among us, touch our hearts, and uh, move us, Lord, toward uh, you and toward heaven. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I appreciate uh, all the music and musicians this morning. I appreciate our young people singing. Uh, for us, that it's always wonderful to have our, our kids take part in the service in Beverly, uh, bringing out the best in that old organ. That thing is, uh, <laughs> it needs to be taken out back and shot, but uh, somehow, she, uh, somehow she is able to make beautiful music out of it, and I just appreciate that so much. But I want to talk to you this morning about the tares as uh, we close out this series on the parable of Jesus in Matthew 13. A tear is a, a biblical word for a weed. Um, this parable isn't uh, shared in the other Gospels. It's, it's unique to this chapter, to Matthew chapter 13. And I want us to study it a little bit more as we see what God wants to tell us uh, from it. So um, I, I got a picture that I want to show you. I, I thought, you know what, I, I, need to, uh, I need to find a picture of some weed. And uh, it's amazing what pops up on the internet when you put in weed and, um, and, and, and pop it up. Uh, so after, after uh, searching through quite a other things that did not pertain to this sermon, um, 
I found a picture of the weed that Jesus was referring to. This is the one that Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 13. It's a lolium timulentum. Lolium timulentum. I'm not, uh, forgive me for butchering uh, my Latin, but that is not my first language. Uh, sarcasm is my, no, I'm just, no, it's not. Uh, it's also noted as, known as the bearded darnel. Anybody ever heard of that one? Uh, can you see how much that looks like wheat? It looks like it, but yet it doesn't. It looks like it, but yet it doesn't. This plant, this bearded darnel, uh, grows in the Middle East and is so similar to barley, uh, which is their main crop in Jesus' times. You remember the barley loaves and fishes? It's so similar to barley that it's nearly impossible to tell the difference. It's nearly impossible to tell the difference. So by the time the farmer could see the difference in the, the, in, in the, in the, the two plants, by the time he could tell the difference, the, we, the roots of the bearded darnel had grown and intertwined with the, with the roots of the good seed so much so that if you try to pull out the one, you're going to destroy the other. But they had to be separated eventually, right? They had to be separated eventually. Well, why, why so? Well, according to uh, the uh, article that I read on the Internet, and I believe everything I read on the Internet, but it is because the bearded darnel is poisonous. So the one on the right is poisonous. The one on the, on the left is, is good, good barley or good wheat. The one on the right will actually cause dizziness and nausea. And besides that, it just doesn't taste very good. <laughs> but it looks just like a barley, especially when it's young. When it's younger, when the plants are first coming up out of the ground, you can hardly tell the difference at all. Well, in our story, an enemy came along and threw weed seed, bearded darnel, out among the good seed in the farmer's field. Now, how long do you think he had to sit around and... and, and can you just go to the store and, and get a, a bag of weed seed? <laughs> no, most, most of the time you can't. Most people want seed that is pure, that doesn't have any weeds in it. In fact, if you go out to buy grass seed, there we go again. I mean, grass, growing grass and lawn grass, golf grass. If you go out to buy that, you, you will see on the bag that it says 99.99% weed-free. Nobody likes weeds. The grain of this darnel is especially poisonous. It causes dizziness and nausea. So if I really hated someone with all my being, I'd sit around in the, at night and pick darnel. Pick bearded Darnell. I would go out and gather Lollium Tamentulum, and I would say, I'm going to get that guy. Now, if, if the farmer that sows the good seed is, is Jesus, then who hates Jesus so much that he would spend all his time, all his energy, figuring out a way to cause Jesus pain? Who would do that? an enemy. We have an enemy, brothers and sisters. Do you guys love Jesus? How many love Jesus here? If you love Jesus, you have an enemy too that hates Jesus. And because he hates Jesus, he also hates you because you love Jesus and you belong to him. And he spends all his considerable energy, all of his wisdom, all of his genius, of the mind that God created in, in, back in the beginning in thinking of ways to hurt Jesus and hurt you. It's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? Well, what about our, our, uh, our bearded Darnell? After the harvest, um, the Darnell had to be picked out by hand. 
Uh, there's a commentator by the name of William Barclay, is one of my favorite uh, Bible writers, uh, writes commentaries on Scripture, but he says that the farmer would hire a group of, of people who knew how to tell the difference between barley and bearded darnel. And he would hire them around harvest time, and they would go through every stock that had been harvested by hand. They would go through, and they would pick out the bearded darnel, they would pick out the weeds, and they would tie them in bundles, and whenever they had gone through the whole harvest, and they had the, the, the bundles of uh, barley on the right, the bundles of bearded darnel on the left, when they had gone through the entire harvest, then they would take the bearded darnel and they would take them out to a safe place and they would light them on fire and burn them so that they would not infest anyone else's field. Well, Jesus himself once said, by their fruits uh, you will know them. These uh, weeds are nearly impossible to tell from good grain until the heads of grain had formed. Um, the good grain had that beautiful golden yellow healthy color. Uh, the darnel had a grayish uh, pale color. You know, grayish and pale, that's kind of the color of death, isn't it? Yeah. The darnel had this grayish pale color. It was easy to tell them apart after they had matured, after they had matured. Does this help us explain sometimes some of the ways that God does things? You know, uh, God sometimes allows evil to go on longer than we're comfortable with. Would you say that? I think I remember Elijah one time saying, How long, O Lord, how long are you going to let this go on? Even great prophets ask God, How long? This, isn't this long enough? How many of you have looked around at the world today and seen the conditions that are going on in the world, seen the evil that seems to reincarnate itself and sprout anew and, uh, and say, Lord, it's mature enough, it's mature. We can, tell the, <laughs> we can tell how long until you come again. And it can be sometimes a discouraging, but one of the reasons that God does that is because he wants there to be a stark contrast so that all can tell the difference between good and evil. He allows a Judas to remain in the group of disciples until Judas reveals his true colors. He could have, he could have identified Judas right off the top, right at the very beginning. Instead, uh, Judas was allowed to, to go with the disciples and be with the disciples and be with Jesus for three and a half years before the truth came out. Lucifer, the covering cherub, the leader of the angel choir, standing in the presence of God, but cherishing that pride and that selfishness in his heart. God could have eradicated him with a snap of his fingers at the very beginning, but instead he lets Lucifer play out this whole miserable sin thing so that we can see the fruits of it. We can see the fruits of it. Look at what it says in Isaiah 14, uh, 12 to 14. How have you fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn? You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. God could have stopped that before it even started. But instead, the way God works is He lets things mature so that everyone can see what He's going to do. God allowed Him time to either repent or rebel. And when His rebellion reached maturity and came out in the open, that's when God took action and removed Him from heaven. Uh, when we look at this uh, text in Revelation 12, 9, it says, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. 
Well, uh, verse 17 describes uh, the, the target of Satan's anger. It says the dragon was enraged with a woman. What is a woman in Bible prophecy? Woman represents what? The church. Whose church? God's church. Is this God's church? Then the devil is angry with you. The devil is angry with us because we're here this morning. We're worshiping God as our creator and as our Lord. Verse 17 describes the target of his anger, those who love Jesus, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Do you have the testimony of Jesus in your heart? Jesus, in, in particular, um, points out that commandment breakers, those who, uh, who love iniquity or lawlessness, will be separated at the harvest. Um, it's a requirement. It's not an option to obey God's Ten Commandments. It's not an option. Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 13, verses 40 and 42, it says, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels. He will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, those who practice iniquity. Lawlessness is the absence of law. What law would that be? God's law, of course. And we'll cast them into the furnace of fire and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Well, look, there's no doubt that Satan has uh, sown seeds of evil in what was God's, once God's perfect creation. We can all see it. Evil is alive and well and become more open and in your face than it ever has been. In our own country, our beloved America, we see things happening, uh, even though uh, even though we have some good things, some great things about this country. Uh, we see some problems. We've got substance abuse. We've got homelessness. We've got pornography. We've got glorified immorality in 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 uh, in all of our our media. We've got the decimation of the family. We've got these these dreadful uh, uh, abortion. Uh, motion uh, rules that have been passed in in different states and we see that the the battle of, of that going back and forth and and all these societal and, and moral weeds that are obvious to uh, bible believing christians but there's other kinds of weeds that are maybe not quite so uh, visible we've got weeds of unbelief that have made their way into the church as well Sometimes we see these uh, weeds when they come to fruition. We see unbiblical teachings that are popular, popular in the world today in the Christian church. Uh, we've got the error of, this, of secret rapture. We've got, you know, things like, like that. Even this, this secret rapture is, uh, is a, held, uh, a belief held by millions of uh, Bible-believing Christians um, but there's, I believe there's, there's no more clearer teaching in Scripture than the literal, audible, climactic return of Jesus to save his children. And yet Satan has been pretty successful in the Christian world uh, with planting the weeds of the secret rapture in God's field of truth. Um, we've got uh, immortality of the soul, e eternal burning hellfire, uh, things like that, you know, that, that our brothers and sisters in other faith traditions uh, believe with all their hearts. And I think that, that God loves those people. I know that God loves them. He's, gonna, he's going to bring out some way to, uh, to bring out uh, uh, truth to, 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 to millions of people before uh, Jesus comes again. He knows who belongs to him. Jesus says, my sheep, here's my voice. And at the end of time, there's going to be one flock and one shepherd because everybody is going to hear the clear voice of Jesus and they're going to flock to Jesus and there will be one flock, one shepherd. That's going to be a great day, isn't it? But we also have some weeds of unbiblical teaching and errors in our own church. We are a people of prophecy. Seventh-day Adventists are a people of prophecy. 
We came into being as a church. We are, we, we are, we are in existence because of Bible prophecy, because of the, the Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, Revelation 14. These great Bible prophecies define Adventism and make us who we are. That, that day for a year principle that proves, you know, the 490 year prophecy from the time of the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, that 70 week prophecy that, that pinpoints the ministry of Jesus from the day it started to the crucifixion to the day the gospel goes to the, to the Gentiles when Stephen is stoned. That prophecy, if, if, if we didn't have any other Bible prophecy, that one would be enough. It proves who Jesus is, proves he's the Messiah. But yet it goes on and proves, uh, and as we see the rest of the prophecy in Daniel 8, 14, that year for a, uh, day for a year principle proves that we are now living in God's judgment day, in God's judgment time, in the time of, of judgment, at the, uh, right before Jesus comes again. These are not just random numbers. They're not just uh, numbers that, uh, that we can vaguely be interested in and then set them to one side as unnecessary. These numbers make us who we are as Adventists. They're the found, some of the foundation of, of our faith, yet Satan has sown belief, unbelief in our own church with some success, even in this area. Another area is... Uh, is uh, what, what is called uh, theistic evolution. I believe that Satan has been very successful in planting those, those weed seeds in the Christian church, and even in our church we see some of that moving in. Theistic evolution. In other words, God, theistic, God started the process of evolution. If God chose... Uh, if God chose billions of years of natural selection and random mutation and, and death and life and death and life and death and life and death and life, then, then God is the author of death. He's not the author of life. If we can't believe Genesis chapter 1, as it's written, then can we believe Genesis chapter 3? which says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and, and your seed. And you will bruise his head, but he, you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. The first prediction that Jesus would come in response to sin, the problem of sin that entered into the world in Genesis chapter 3. If we can't believe Genesis chapter 1, and we can't believe Genesis chapter 3, well, how about Genesis chapter 6? where God sees violence covering the earth and the thoughts of men's hearts continually on evil and how to do evil and how to plan evil. What are we going to do this Saturday night? What are we going to do this Friday night? Let's do something bad. That's what, what, what the earth was like. Not much different today. But God says this, this can't be. This can't be. It's going to wipe out my, my line of faithful people. And so, so a flood comes to the earth and, and cleanses the earth. And, and God, God saves the line of, of godly people through Noah and his family. But if we can't believe Genesis chapter 1, then why should we believe Genesis chapter 3? And why should we believe Genesis chapter 6? If Genesis chapter 1 is a lie, then everything we believe in from the seventh-day Sabbath, because that's where Genesis chapter 1 ends, isn't it? Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, when God saw he, that, that everything he made was good, and he rested and he blessed and he made holy the seventh day, that's all in those first six chapters, brothers and sisters. If that's not true, then why are we here today? Why don't we just come tomorrow like the rest of the Christian world? Better yet, why come at all? Seventh-day Sabbath is a memorial of the six literal days of creation that God spoke this world and everything into, in it into existence when he formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. If Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3 are gone, 
then you're wasting your time being here today. Your faith is a lie. Adam and Eve sinning, that's a lie. Sin, it's not even a, a concept we need to be worried about. Therefore, Jesus Christ dying on the cross to save the world from sin, who needs it? The resurrection of the dead? <laughs> Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. My dad used to always say, you know, the uh, Sadducees, uh, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, and that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the Sabbath, and it was very good. Not billions and billions of years of death and life and trying to get it right and trying to get it right in some, uh, some, some sadistic laboratory. If God's powerful enough to start life, he's powerful enough to, to, to start it like he says he started it. Well, Revelation 13 and 14 and the three angels' messages that include the Sabbath and the mark of the beast, these are biblical teachings that have come into question lately in our church. People, uh, you know, in the, out there in the Christian world, along with the with the uh, the, uh, the Left Behind series and, and things like that, we've got we've got the uh, you know the belief that Antiochus Epiphanes was the is the little horn power and all that kind of stuff, and and uh, uh, unfortunately, it's even come into our own church. I could keep going. Uh, one of the most insidious weeds I think is the is a weed that that uh, you can do whatever you want God doesn't care about what you do he'll love you he forgives you uh, you can do whatever you want I think that is uh, a a very bad weed seed <laughs> it does matter what we do it matters a lot what we do the Bible says to flee from immorality. How come? Because immorality will hurt us. Yes, God loves us. Yes, He forgives us. Absolutely. Praise God for His grace. But God cares about what we do. God cares about the choices that we make and the things that we do in our life. It matters to Him because the choices that we make decide our eternal destiny. No sanctuary in heaven, the Holy Spirit is not a person, blah, blah, blah. All of these are, are weeds in God's truth. Um, in God's truth. I wanted to look at uh, um, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse uh, 1. It says, uh, um, I got the wrong thing on there, I can't read it that far. It says, but there were also false prophets among people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Now, if the good seed is the word of God and the bad seed is error, then is, this, is, is, is Peter talking about Jesus? Uh, I think he is. He said there will be false teachers that, that come in among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies like the, like the enemy that goes out and scatters the weed seed in the dark where nobody can see him. Even denying the Lord who bought them and bring, themselves, bring on themselves swift destruction. So we're warned by Peter, we're warned by Paul that from our own selves, from among us, from even from... Christians, Bible-believing Christians, Satan has been somewhat successful in planting his weed seed. But here's the good seed. Here's the good news. God knows the difference between good seed and weeds. He knows the difference, and he will tell us if we ask him. He will show us if we ask him. 
The Bible uh, uh, that says in great controversy, those who have fortified their minds with the truths of God's word will be able to stand up to whatever crisis comes along, whether it's a theological crisis, whether it's a, a, a economical crisis, whether it's a societal crisis. If you have fortified your mind with the truths of God word, God's word, and you're clinging to those prayers, you're standing on those promises, you're hanging on to those promises, and you're counting on God, then you will be on a firm foundation. God is able to keep those who belong to Him. He is able to take the weeds out of our life, because sometimes we, we let those weeds grow in our own hearts, sometimes too, don't we? Sometimes the enemy comes along and, and plants the seed of doubt. And instead of uh, claiming a promise that applies directly to that doubt, we, we kind of let that doubt fester and, and we let it grow. And, and when that doubt comes to maturity, then it becomes much more painful to get it out than it would have been when it was just a little bitty guy. But God is able to even handle that. He can handle the weeds in, in your heart and in my heart. If God is able to to keep those who belong to him. If we choose to live by faith in Jesus and his word, then the Bible says we will be among those who shine like the sun in the kingdom of our Father. Um, I want to leave you with just one text. Uh, 2 Timothy uh, 1, verse 12, it says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. God can do that if you'll let him in your heart and in mine. He will keep you. He will, he will, he is a good physician. He's the, he can heal disease. He's the, the fabulous farmer. He can weed. He can, he can renew soil in your life and, and, and plant his gospel and his word and cause it to grow and you will bear fruit for him if you stay committed to him. That's what I want to be. I want to be totally committed to my Lord Jesus. Do you? If that's what you want, bow your heads with me and pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we see the results of, of Satan's work everywhere. Uh, it's becoming uh, blatant in the world and in the church. Uh, Lord, we choose to commit to you. We choose to commit to, you, to your word. We pray that as the, farm, as the good farmer, you will plant the seed of the gospel in our hearts. Lord, may we open our Bibles and, and, and allow that, that good seed to sink deep into the, the soil of our minds. And let the Holy Spirit just rain that water down so that, that the growth of, of your kingdom, Lord, in our hearts and our lives will be abundant and evident to everybody that we meet. Lord, thank you for hearing our prayer. Forgive us, Lord, for, for, for hanging on to our weeds. Forgive us for not letting you do your work, Lord. We, we open our hearts and our minds to you, and we pray that Jesus will do that wonderful work in us so that as it says in Philippians 1, verse 6, he who began a good work in you was faithful to complete it unto the day of Christ Jesus. Lord, may that day be soon, and may we all be waiting and ready when you come again, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.